Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the No Limit Selling Podcast, and today we have uh, Tom Ellis with us here. Tom, uh, any buttons that you can go live on on your end? Let me see here. Uh, While you're figuring that out, I am going to hit uh, go on the show. The No Limit Selling Podcast, where mindset meets sales and leadership. All right, Tom, welcome to the show. We'll figure that stuff out later. Uh, so tell me, how long have you been in the sales business of actually helping others become better at selling their products and services? That is a great question, Kotuma. Um Wow, it's been about 30 years that I've been doing this, um, helping people become better at sales. So in some ways, sales is the easiest thing to do in the world, and uh, I can prove it because, you know, ask any three-year-old, when you want chocolate ice cream, which parent do you go to and how do you pitch it? And those little critters know exactly. I need to go to dad and say it this way, and he's going to say, yes, let's do it. So naturally, we have the sales ability, but as we get older, uh we make it a lot more complicated than it should be. And one of those areas of complication is our own mindset that gets in the way of uh, executing at the level we want. So talk about mindset. How does mindset uh, hinder us and help us in the sales uh, process? So, Omar, that's an excellent question. And I have this conversation with most of my prospects and clients all the time. You know, I say before I can teach you and coach you, On sales, I have to change the way that you think about sales. And people think about sales as being hard, hardcore, and it's something that they're not comfortable doing. But as you just mentioned, I will remind them of what they did in their childhood Mm. when when they wanted that ice cream or that dollar, you know, and they picked the parent and they pitched the parent and they closed the deal. And so I talk to people about, listen, You've been selling your entire life. You've sold your first job, right? You told them that you were the best thing ever. If you got married, you sold your spouse on how you would be a wonderful spouse and how you can help them. So we've been doing this selling thing for a long time. But I think the big thing that I get clients to think about, Omar, is remove the word sell and add the word help. So instead of me selling you something, let me help you solve a problem. And that makes most people that I work with very comfortable. So that's that's very interesting and very important, just that small little distinction. I used to live out in uh, Silicon Valley in California, and we would do uh, soup to nuts, help companies launch into the U.S. market. One of the things we would do is package design. And one of the ways you can do package design is to have focus groups and really think about, you know, what needs to be in that package to communicate the value of that product. And what we would do is go into this place called Fry's Electronics. There were these electronic stores that were 100,000 square foot of tech nirvana. So there were our people there. And as people were leaving their cars in the parking lot, going into the Fry's Electronics, we would stop them and say, can I have a moment of your time? And almost everybody would say, no, I'm busy and would not engage with us. But if we said, can you help me for a moment? 95% of people would stop and say, how can I help? You know, we're designing this package and uh, all we need to find out is which one do you like better? This one or that one? And we'd have our design and a competitor design. And they'd say, I like that one better. Why? What could we do better here? And we would get a focus group done in like uh, three minutes of conversation We'd have uh, 20 of those conversations in like 30, 40 minutes, an hour, and then go back, redesign the package. So asking for help, people want to help. Absolutely. So one of the things that gets in the way of people being really successful at sales is having that initial conversation. So the question to you, uh, Tom, is this, is how relevant is cold calling in a digital era? So it's, it's very relevant. And, you know, I like to use the word, I don't use the word cold calling as much because first of all, it makes people antsy and they're going, oh, I mean, I'm calling the show. 
uh, somebody I don't know and what do I say? And I, and I go, well, listen, there's a tool out there called LinkedIn that can help you make not cold calls, but kind of warm calls because mm. I can look at somebody's profile and I can figure out what common ground we have. And then I can strike up a, a conversation based on our common ground. They may comment on a post I did. They may like it. And that gives me the opportunity to kind of reach out and say, hey, Umar, I appreciate you liking my post on cold calling. Would love to join your network. And so I use LinkedIn as a tool to kind of help me take that warm call and make it kind of warm. Right. Uh, I was actually doing a sales call with uh, a guy that uh, is the general sales manager at a printing company, and I noticed that he worked at Hewlett Packard at one point, <clears throat> and I consulted for them. And I go, oh, I noticed uh, – so we're talking, talking, talking. I say, oh, I noticed that you worked for Hewlett Packard. I did some consulting with them, and the tone of his voice changed instantly. Oh, really? Where did you consult? And because when we came out of the caves, we had uh, – uh, one thing we knew for certain that anybody that was not in our tribe would potentially kill us. And so as <laughs> soon as you go on LinkedIn and go, Oh, we both know HP. They were part of their tribe and it just warms up the call instantly. You can hear it change. Absolutely. So, uh, what are the most uh, effective strategies in 2024 to Get on a call with someone, and certainly LinkedIn is one way, is doing some research on them. What are some other ways to kind of really get the uh, – make it relevant so you're not wasting your time calling, you're actually gaining clients? Well, you know, my most powerful way that I use and teach clients is LinkedIn, obviously. And there is um, attending networking events to where you're going to networking events where you're – target audiences and finding out in advance that they're going to actually be there and show up and, and ha have a conversation with them. Brilliant. Face-to-face, -face, can't beat it. So the most important uh, element of a cold call is the first 10 seconds. Like if you can't get past the first 10 seconds, it ain't going to happen. Or you set the tone for the call in the first 10 seconds. So, uh, Tom, how should the first 10 seconds go uh, in a call? So the first 10 seconds should be you learning about them. How my name is and tell me a little bit about what you do. So you always want to be engaging with them from their standpoint. And not necessarily pitching them anything because you're trying to build a relationship. And the first part of building a relationship is understanding the person that you're speaking with. Brilliant. You know, a common uh, thing that I like using is, is, you know, find, once again, common ground to get them to open up and, and start speaking with, with you. So, Tom, what's a good uh, strategy to get more first appointments? That is another great question. So the strategy that I use and employ clients to actually use is to make sure that you're focusing on your target audience. So you have to understand who is a good fit for your product or services, number one. Number two, you need to find out the title of the person in that company that will be responsible for making this happen and what are the benefits to them of using your products and services. And the third thing is to reach out and touch them and, and start to build the relationship. Superb. And uh, so tell us about a client that you were uh, chasing that took a little while to get there. Walk us through that <laughs> process of not giving up and uh, uh, to be tenacious enough to be successful. So, you know what, Omar, that's most of my clients, right? <laughs> yep. Because nobody I call on the first time says, hey, Thomas, come on in. We've been waiting for you, right? right. So it's, it is a constant being 
what I've coined a, a, a phrase called being pleasantly persistent. And so there was a client I was working with in the credit union space, and I met them at a networking event, and we agreed to have a follow-up conversation. And so we have the conversation uh, to, to figure out what they were looking for and and if we were a good fit, tried to set up the n- next meeting, and um, I got ghosted. Ah. And so, yeah, you, you know, where people, you know, they were interested, and all of a sudden I couldn't find them, couldn't reach them. And so being my pleasantly persistent self, I know I was sending an email with, some content, not anything that I wrote, on something that I thought they would be interested in reading. And I did that for several months. Um, and I happened to be at a networking ev- event and saw this person, and they profusely apologized. They were having some issues internally, so on and so forth, and we reengaged. But he said the thing that impressed him most about me was I just kept following up, kept sending him great articles um, on things that, that were, he was interested in. But like I tell people, I wasn't on his priority page. I didn't make the priority page because when you're on somebody's priority page, the cadence, there's a nice cadence to it. And so once I got on his radar and I stayed on there, I was able to close that particular deal and work, and work with that team for about six months. So one of the things that uh, salespeople uh, imagine is I'm going to be a pest. I don't want to call them today. I've called them too soon. Uh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And the reality is nobody cares about you, that they don't remember that you reached out 21 times. All they remember is that on the 21st time when you reached out, they had a need. And it's like, Thomas, where have you been? Yeah, we need to talk. And so uh, right now, if I try to sell you uh, a hot tub and you already have one or you have no need for one, uh, doesn't matter how good a salesperson I am, I'm not going to force you to buy one. But if I happen to call just when the missus said, we need a hot tub, you're going to be, Umar, my man, let's move forward. So uh, don't be shy. Keep on reaching out. Do it in a respectful way and do it in a strategic way, and that is how you uh, get clients and make a difference in the world. And, Uma, that's exactly the, the strategy that I employ, and that's the strategy that I teach my clients is no means not now. It doesn't mean never. It just means not now yeah. because we don't know what's going on in their lives personally, professionally, they may be interested in our products and services, but the timing isn't right. And I always tell people that when they think about the services that you provide, you want to be top of mind with them. And the only way to be top of mind is by what I coined the phrase being pleasantly persistent. And it may take time, but most salespeople, and there's all kind of data out there that says, it takes five to 12 contacts to close a sale. So five to 12. So most people give up on the second attempt. Ah, I'm not calling them anymore. They're not interested. But I would keep calling you and contacting you in a variety of ways, emails, phone, LinkedIn, however, wherever they are, see them at events and just saying hi. So I developed the points to where I am top of mind to this particular prospect that when they are ready, they call. And I've had people call me six months, a year later, say, I was at a webinar of yours or a workshop, and I've been following you on, on LinkedIn. I have a need. I think that you can help me. Yep. Uh, one of the things that uh, hurts a lot is when uh, your childhood tweet tells you I'm dating someone else. And the second thing is – uh, you call up after six months and it's like, oh, my God, Thomas, we just signed somebody else because you left them 
uh, to their own devices for six months. That hurts a lot. And that does. Uh, so, so if you want to respect the client, how can we educate them in a way that uh, adds value to them? And sending content and content and connections on a regular basis that adds value to them is the secret to uh, making that connection. I've had clients before that uh, have finally started working with me, and it's like, uh, hey, Umar, I've been uh, stalking you for the last uh, three years. Uh, and it's like, why don't you leave a comment or a like or anything? Because I love your content, but I never interacted in any way. But now the time's right. I want to work with you. And I think that's what we uh, – what we need to realize is if you've got value, people value it. And uh, one of the ways to figure yeah. out what that is, talk to your existing clients. What did you that value is, most? Mm -hmm. That is that is so true because many times, you know, and we've I, – I, I, I've experienced – I call it the invisible client. And I tell people I, I work with, I said, people – there's somebody watching you that's admiring you, Right? It's kind of like the date that looks at you and says, boy, I would like to date that person, but they're afraid, they're waiting for the right timing to do that. And clients do the same thing. They watch what you post. They watch how people interact with you. They say, you know, when I'm ready to get this product and services, I know that I'm going to call on this person. And it may be six months. It may be a year that this happened. I had uh, a residential property management company in Baltimore call me on LinkedIn and said, I want to talk to you about coming in and doing a workshop for my 35 residential agents. So we help on the phone and Heather and I are talking and, and Heather says, I've been watching you for six months. I said, no, Heather, you've been stalking me for six yeah. months. And she says, I love the content. I love how people interact with you. Can you come up and do this workshop? And she says, I think you would fit very well with my team. And you know, negotiated a deal, got paid before I got there. And that you was better. all to for the fact that I was providing content that they related to over a period of time. Superb. And I think that's, uh, uh, I think Winston Churchill said it best. When you get to hell, keep going. <laughs> the success is on the other side of that. So, Tom, what is one, uh, one piece of advice that you would give people uh, that want to do better at getting those first appointments? So the one advice I can give you is be persistent, be relevant, and be active. Superb. Uh, any questions for me around this topic before we part company? No, sir. It's been an honor to, to speak with you. I know we've been trying to do this for a, a year now, and I'm finally happy that this, is, this has happened. Superb, Tom. Have a great, uh, excellent rest of the day and uh, go sell something. Thank you. I'll, I'm, I'm on my way to do it right now. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye-bye.